let's start with building kernel and I'm going to do the initial kernel from scratch and as I said uh, previously I'm going to then do another video which shows you how to update the kernel um, because there's one thing with the kernel is a config file and that's got all the settings for the current kernel and that is really precious you want to keep that because otherwise um, if you need to rebuild the kernel and you haven't got that config file it means you've got to go through uh, configuring the kernel again and as you'll see it can be quite laborious to do that so one, once you've got that config you want to um, keep hold of it although um, well I can't remember when it was introduced now it was some while back maybe 10 years ago but possibly even as much as 15 years ago uh, they did um, introduce an option into the kernel where the configuration could become part of the kernel so the the kernel retains its own settings and as we'll see it's easy it's, it's quite easy to extract those settings um, once once they're in the kernel and I'll really advise setting this option I'll, I'll reiterate this when we come to this option because it means if you've got a um, a kernel without modules so you've built a monolithic kernel which is just basically one file um, it means you can use that one one kernel file between machines and you can extract the config from that monolithic file and then tweak it and rebuild the kernel on the, on that other machine so it's a really useful thing to to um, have around anyway let's start building it um, so the place to get the basic um, kernel from is the uh, kernel Linux kernel archives and as you can see the web address for that is www.kernel.org and this is the page you're presented with um, what I'm going to do there's currently um, the main the latest release as you can see is 5.14.12 which is this line here um, this is the link here that's that yellow box would take you to uh, what I've done is I've downloaded two versions. I've downloaded the previous version, which as you can see says end of life. So that's roughly a month old. I've downloaded that version. That's the version I'm going to build from scratch. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the current version, uh, showing you how to update the previous version which is the initial one I'm going to build showing you how to update it to the later version and obviously that obviously that method will be uh, the same for any upgrade that you do so um, I've already downloaded these to save a bit of time but the links you would require if you wanted to look at one of these older versions for example is this tarball version here and then obviously if you're interested in some of the more um, finer points of uh, the kernel or you're updating from a, a point release you want to just get the diff you can do that and so on so yeah so I've got the um, two tarballs here as you can see the um, older version which is the one I'm going to be building initially and the newer version the current version which is the one that I'm going to be um, updating to so the first thing I need to do is to extract the source files now um, you may want to rebuild the kernel to add in um, some functionality for a bit of specialized hardware you've got that you know maybe something you plug in the USB or it might be a PCI adapter PCIe adapter um, and it needs the software to be built against the kernel or built into the kernel something like that um, in which case you're probably probably better off using the source uh, the kernel source files from your own distribution probably I say um, it could be easier to uh, build and configure and install it um, but by showing you the generic way of doing it it means you're aware of how a plain vanilla kernel is built and you can adapt that to any other distribution that you may come across you'll, you'll be aware of how it's done in a standard way and um, you know you'll, you'll find out how your own distribution does it and how you need to adapt it so um, as I say if, if you're doing something like that like building for a specialized bit of hardware you're probably 
better off keeping with the version um, of the kernel that your distribution's got just by using the source that um, is available or made available with your distribution. But there's nothing to stop you using the generic version anyway. Um, and you might find it's actually newer than the one that comes with uh, your distribution. So here I am, I've extracted the kernel source files, I've changed into the directory. Uh, now from the Linux from scratch instructions, it always recommend running the command make mr proper, which cleans all of the files from the um, kernel sources, any previous stuff that has been left behind. It says there that in the Linux instructions that the maintainers recommend that. I must admit I've never actually seen this written anywhere but it must have said it at some time. I don't know if it's still the case or not but I always do it out of habit. You, if you're unsure about something just do it anyway because then you are sure that you know it's supposed to clean the output directory or directories. Um, you know if you've run it you're going to be starting from a fresh uh, installation so um, it's always advisable to do it if you're unsure. So that's what I've done. It's it's not come back with anything which indicates that it's not actually cleaned anything. So the source um, of the kernel w was probably actually already clean. You'll notice if you do make MR proper on a um, source directory, a kernel source directory, where you've worked on it before, you'll see little messages coming up saying it's um, cleaning certain directories and so on. So as I say, the fact that it's not come up with any anything on the screen probably indicates there wasn't anything there originally. So the next thing we could do, we could go straight into the Make Menu Config uh, option and just start editing. It will create a default set of options um, and you can just start editing all the options within the menu system. But um, if you do make help, you'll find that there's quite a few options you can pass in to make. Um, some of which tell you various ways of configuring. So you can see there's all the configuration targets here, which allow you to um, select the options. Uh, the one that I use by default is this one here. You'll notice there's one there for, in fact, there's two there now. I didn't know that. Uh, there's one for a QT based front end and a GTK based front end. Um, I used, I think it was XConfig, I'm not sure now. When I first started with Linux, um, which is probably just about 20 years ago, just over 20 years now, um, and I first started building my own kernels, I did use the graphical environment, but I found that I preferred the. Um, this menu config option and just do it from a, um, a command line, a, a shell prompt. Um, I found that to be uh, preferable, but you might find that you, you know, prefer one way or the other to to um, configure the kernel itself. But I, I will be showing the menu based one, this menu config. It does actually need n curses, uh, despite the fact that the one the line above says it's an n curses menu based program. Um, the menu config is also in curses based. Whether these two are the same option with different names, I don't know. Um, never run in config before. Um, the config option, I think that's just a interactive uh, option where it asks you the questions you type yes or no. So that that could be quite lengthy because um, a lot of the options you'd be, you'd be answering no to, I imagine. So. Um, probably why I'd uh, stick with the menu config. Another thing about it with the men menu config, a lot of the time, a lot of the machines I work on, they don't have any X servers running. There's no graphical environment. Uh, they are just servers. So you're going to be stuck with a, com a, a, a shell prompt anyway. So it's probably best in your best interest if you uh, that sort of person doesn't always use a, a GUI uh, to learn the menu config option just because you know that it'll always be usable or nearly, nearly always. Uh, as I say, it does need NCurses, so it obviously wouldn't work if NCurses wasn't installed, but I'd imagine that NCurses is probably nearly always um, installed on any Linux installation. 
Um, then the other config commands are, are all commands um, about uh, configuring a default set of configuration options. Um, the one that I use and demonstrate when in my Linux from Scratch and Gen 2 videos is this def config because as it says there it creates a, a reasonable default based on the architecture you're using. So if you're using for example a you know 32 bit 486 for example it, it will create some settings that are quite reasonable for that processor. Um, if you're using a 64 bit um, processor then obviously it will enable 64 bit and um, enable other options that are, are more reasonable to that kind of architecture as well. Um, then there's other things, other options here where all the defaults are set to no, all the defaults set to yes, and so on. Um, another one where it selects all the modules where possible, which is probably an option that you'd use if you're building a distribution because you'd want to have everything built so that the modules could be enabled as and when certain hardware was installed i.e. you wouldn't know what hardware the kernel would be running on because it's distribution so you just build everything and and uh, everything would be loaded as, as is needed um, I think some of these options are probably like this random one they're probably for benchmarking maybe or just to test uh, unknown combinations possibly um, but you can see there's quite a a few options there to um, tinker around with. I will be starting with the def config, as I say, it's quite reasonable. Um, I've, I seem to remember originally when I used to build a kernel, if I did a def config, there would be a lot of stuff enabled that uh, was unnecessary, a lot of drivers enabled. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case now. Def config does produce quite a compact. Uh, set of options but you will see as, as I go through that there are um, some options that I'll be disabling and indeed there'll be other ones um, I'll enable but it's qu quite reasonable as I say I, I use that option when I do my Linux from Scratch and Gen 2 videos because it, it's quite sane uh, it's not too big uh, and it's it, it does tend to work straight away so it's a good place to start from um, yeah, so there's other options here, um, things that we're not particularly interested in, um, even like building uh, packaging for the kernel that we build and documents and so on. Uh, there's some options here about how um, to control the amount of output when it's compiling, but uh, it's not really anything to worry about unless you're particularly interested in seeing a lot more detail. Um, one thing to note there that make or make all of the same target and they'll build um, everything that gets selected in the kernel which kind of makes sense. Uh, sorry no it's not everything in the kernel it's the everything that's uh, got a star against it so you can see that this has got a star with this BZ image which is the target that's get built, that gets built. Uh, the bare kernel and any modules get built as well so that's that's all you really need to know to build a kernel so the first thing I'm going to do is to run make def config and what this does it creates defaults um, as you can see it creates some files and in particular what it's done it's written a config file called dot config and because it begins with a full stop you're probably already aware that it's a hidden file so just before I do anything else you'll notice it said it's created a default config based on a 64-bit uh, x86 architecture so if I do ls minus l of course that dot config is not visible because it's hidden by that dot so if I do ls minus la you can see it's there so it's can get quite confusing if you forget that it's a hidden configuration file. You might think, oh, you know, I want to copy that, and I'm like, where is it? You know, I can't see it. Um, but yeah, just uh, have to keep your wits about you that it, it is actually a hidden file. Uh, we can look at that because it's a plain text file, but as you'll see, it's not advisable to modify it. It does say there, automatically generate, do not edit it. Um, I have tried. In my early days modifying it and all that happens is that your modifications get 
overwritten. Even I believe, even if you decide not to make make any saves to the config, I might be wrong now. I can't exactly remember, but the um, configuration part of the kernel it validates things, so it will overwrite it, rewrite the config file. So don't ever bother doing any changes here. It's just a um, pointless thing to do. What this is useful for, if you're reading something on, on the internet you want to enable, and for example, they say that you need to enable, uh, it might say something like either config underscore rdgzip or it might just say rdgzip every single options prefix with config underscore so some people quote the whole uh, name of the option and some people just quote the name without the config underscore uh, what it does mean is you can do something like cat uh, dot config um, and grep uh, say rd underscore and you can see specifically what options are set so if we did uh, gzip you can see straight away that for the current configuration that this rd gzip option is set because it's got a yes there um, if it's not set it will be a, a no in the menu as you'll see uh, the configuration it explicitly says it's not set the other option you might see is um, a module. Um, yeah, it's set to equal M rather than Y. Um, and these are the modules that can be effectively plugged in during runtime. So it might be that you've got a USB device, you plug it in, the uh, system, the UDEV system will see that USB device, it'll identify it, it'll ask the kernel if you've got any knowledge of this and kind of say yeah I've got a module it will load the module into memory and activate the USB device um, usually I tend to build everything into the kernel so I've got one monolithic kernel um, that's just my preference it's because I do sometimes move a kernel from one machine to another to save me rebuilding it uh, it's just laziness really uh, another thing is that um, I don't really see the point of modules on a Linux system where you're specifically building uh, a kernel for that machine. Um, and also, it, I think it tends to be that you're building drivers in and modules for stuff that's going to be active all the time. If, for example, it is a USB device that you're going to be plugging in or unplugging, then yes, that, that's a good time to have a module because, all right, it's only probably a small portion of memory that you could be saving. But yes, you could be saving a little bit of memory because as soon as that device is unplugged, the module's not required. It'll be evicted from memory and, you, you, you know, the kernel reclaims that memory back for itself or for the system. Um, so I tend not to use modules. Distributions use modules all over the place because they don't know what hardware the distribution is going to be installed on. Therefore, it makes sense to have modules because then the distribution only, or the kernel for the, that, that, that distribution only needs to load the modules for the hardware that that dis distribution's uh, loaded on. Another thing with distributions is you'll tend to see that they use an initial RAM disk and that again, partially because of the modules issue, if you've got your SCSI drivers or your um, SATA drivers as modules, uh, it would mean that the kernel couldn't boot because they're modularized. So certain things do need to be built in unless you're new using an in initial RAM disk where it's basically a blob of code that's got enough drivers to get the kernel running. Um, it then hands over to the kernel and if any of those drivers that are in the initial RAM disk uh, are modularized, then obviously that, that memory is freed in that case as well. So that's another thing I tend not to use is the initial RAM disk. Again, it's not. I don't think it's important for a machine you're building um, specifically for. It also makes things a lot simpler. It's a lot more work to build an initial RAM disk, especially by hand. Um, 
I can only think of one situation where you would need an initial RAM disk uh, if you're building by hand. And I, I believe, if I remember rightly, if you need hibernation, the, you need an initial RAM disk then because uh, you need some way. Uh, I don't know if you know how the hibernation works on, on the Linux, but basically the when you hibernate, the kernel copies the contents of the memory and it needs to put it somewhere. And I believe the usual place is in the swap partition, which is why you'll see sometimes people recommend the swap partitions uh, exactly the same size as, or at least as big as, um, the memory. So it will copy the contents of the memory and, and copy to the RAM, uh, to the swap partition. And that's because the swap partition is not, not used when the machine's shut down. Uh, so it's a good place to store the, the data that's in the memory. Now, obviously, when you power on the machine, you need some way of recovering that, that data. And an initial RAM disk is a good way of doing that because um, you want to recover that image back into memory before you do anything else. You don't want to start loading drivers and writing to the uh, hard disk if um, you've got a partially saved state of the machine because you could end up corrupting uh, the hard the information on the hard disk or you know at the very least losing information that was uh, active or open files that were open at the time that the hibernation occurred so that I believe is the only time you probably for a machine you're building kernel for that you really need an initial RAM disk um, so I will be you'll see me go through and tend to build a kernel that doesn't have modules and I won't be building an initial RAM disk because there isn't really any point and say it's a lot more work there is an exception to the modules bit some devices need device drivers that are modularized they won't work if they're built in, into the kernel i'm not sure why that is um whether it's because other parts of the kernel need to be initialized and they take time before these modules or these this um these drivers uh are activated maybe these drivers are activated before other bits are able to get activated in the kernel I don't know but certainly wireless uh, drivers so drivers for Wi-Fi some network uh, interface cards um, are best or, or indeed won't work as modules I know I think I've got some machines that use the TG3 um, I think a Tigon 3 I think is the name of it a Tigon 3 a network interface card they will not work built in or certainly in the past they've never worked built in so I have to build them as modules um, they're also massively recognized by the kernel so I don't need to do any configuration or anything um, it's just that the kernel needs to have them as a module to be able to activate the network card correctly and as I say a lot of Wi-Fi adapters um, need to uh, be in, configured as modules um, so I can show you that as well anyway. So yeah, let's get back to it. Um, so at the moment we've extracted the kernel sources. We've run make def config to create a default config. So now let's go into the menu config option to actually do some changes. Um, I did think about building this default uh, config as it is just to see how big the kernel image that's created but as I say it creates quite a reasonably compact kernel anyway so I don't think there'd be much of a saving um, I think generally the kernel on this machine is about is it about 10 meg or so I think Let's mount the boot first. Right, okay, so this is the default Gen 2 one, and it's about, that's the kernel image there, it's about 7.5 megabytes, so it'd be interesting to see um, what the generic one is. Now, I have to say, I, that is a custom kernel as well, I, or is it? I'm not sure now. It might be a custom kernel, I can't remember. Um, well, we'll see what a custom kernel, how that compares to this one. Um, I did think that a generic def config was about 9 or 10 meg, so this could well be a custom kernel. Um, 
I do know for a fact that a lot of my kernels are a lot smaller than this. They vary between 4 meg and 6 meg, depending on whether I've built in um, any firmware, uh, which is something else I'll mention when we come to it. So we'll, we'll see as uh, we go through. So um, this is the top level menu of the kernel. I'll be going through each and every option. Uh, there won't be a lot that I'll be missing, so it can get quite tedious doing this. Um, as I say, once you've got that config um, for a kernel and it's working, you want to keep it. Um, and I will be showing you how to build it into the kernel anyway, which helps avoid losing the config. Uh, sometimes I'm a bit mindless and I run MR proper on a uh, kernel source and accidentally delete the config because that's one of the files that gets cleaned up. Uh, so I should be showing you how to access that once it's built into the kernel. So let's go into the first option, which is general setup. Um, I won't be talking about every single option. There's there's too much to talk about. A lot of it, I don't know what it does. Um, and this is good advice I can give you. If you're not sure what it does, read the help. Sometimes the help advises what you should be setting that option to. Um, and it advises you, it says something like, if you're not sure what to do, do yes or do no so it is quite handy to read the help you can either do shift question mark to get the help or just move over to the help or I believe you can press H yes so there's several ways of getting the help up and you can see it tells you what to do on the help this information here is quite useful it tells you the name of the symbol as they call it so this is what is written into the .config file. So in the .config, this would have config underscore compile underscore test, and then it would say equals n. And this is telling us at the moment that this option is not set. It tells you what type of selection it is. Um, there's some other information here. And it tells you what the prompt is, uh, which is the prompt that appears in the main menu. So it says they compile also drivers will, which will not load. And you can see it's exactly the same text there. This is quite important. It tells you what it depends upon. So it depends on has IOMEM. And that means that has IOMEM must be enabled. And conveniently, it does tell you how that option is configured. And it is actually enabled because it says equals Y. And it also tells you whereabouts it's located. There are some other um, things that appear here, which I'll uh, mention. Probably best to mention now, actually, if I find any of them. Uh, uh, maybe it's best that I'll mention them when they come along. So, so most of the defaults you can leave, um, but it's worth going down each one and checking. Um, you know if if and what you can change so the first one that's quite useful to modify is the local version what this does it appends some text to the uh, kernel release uh, so if we do help so you can see it says appends an extra string to the end of your kernel version so th this is quite useful because uh, if as I say like me you you want to chat move this kernel and use it on a different machine by appending some information to the name of the kernel you can see straight away an indication of what machine it came from. For example, if you put in uh, some details about the machine or you might want to put some other information, for example, when you compiled it or what you compiled into it, for example. So what I tend to put is a, a dash because you don't get any automatic separators put in. And then I normally put some information about the machine. So for example, this is on a um, i5 7400 machine, so I'll probably do something like that. And you can put, I'm not sure how big that string is, but um, I think I've had 20 or 30 characters there, which is woefully long, but uh, yeah, you can put quite a bit in, in there. Um, so that's the text that gets applied to the text. So when you do you name, um, that's the text that will be appended to the version. Uh, this option here, if you set this, 
actually appends it to the name of the kernel, the actual um, string uh, gets appended to the file name that gets created. Uh, so if we go down, um, I'll just mention, I won't mention everything as I say, I'll mention anything that's important even if I don't change it. Um, a lot of these you can keep. As I say, it's easy to mess things up here and disable something that's important for booting, so that's why it tends to be best not to disable things unless you're absolutely sure. Um, one thing I'm going to disable is this option here. If you read the help about it, it says this option enables the use lib syscall or system call used in the dynamic lim linker from libc5 and earlier. Well, modern glibcs are libc6, so unless you know you're using... Um, an old libc which is libc5 um, and as it says there if you intend to run programs built on libc5 you'll need to enable it but current as it says current systems can safely disable this so just press spacebar there you can do no to disable it similarly the spacebar toggles the option or yes or pressing the y key for yes or the n key for no will force that option Um, so let's go down to preemption model. So if I select this, you can see there's three options here. Basically, whether there's no preemption, so as a server, it will act on any requests in its own time. Voluntary preemption for an ordinary desktop or a low latency, the preemptible kernel, low latency desktop that might be something like, uh, I don't know, video preps, uh, let's see what the... Yeah, it allows applications to run more slow, smoothly when the, uh, the system is under low and the load. So you'd have to make a decision on what use the desktop is being put to and make an appropriate selection there. So you can see this one um, is not preemptible as much um, but it, as it says here, allows applications to run more smoothly than it would do if it wasn't preemptible. So, tend to either keep that option or maybe put it on here if I know I need. Maybe if you're playing games, possibly on Linux, then uh, you probably would want a low latency one. But I'll leave that as a default, I think. Uh, so, next important ones this kernel dot config support now this is the option that's really important where the dot config uh, file i.e. the file that we've seen which stores all the configuration about the com uh, the kernel that we're building this is the one that stores it in the kernel itself so it makes the configuration portable with the kernel and as I say you I recommend you set you turn this on now if I press spacebar here the first option is an M and that shows that it's going to be built into the kernel, uh, at, sorry, it's going to be built as a module. You really want this built into the kernel, I, I think, in my opinion. Um, so you want to either press yes or press spacebar twice there to um, ensure that the star is in the option. Uh, I suppose it's worth pointing out, if you're not already aware, the square brackets indicate a yes or no option. The angled brackets, the chevrons, indicate a yes or no option or that option can be modularized, which is why the first option was M and not a no, uh, a yes, sorry, or a no. So when you press the space bar, it will toggle through three options, the no, the module, and the yes. In the square brackets, the space bar only toggles between yes or no. So you can see straight away the angled ones have got an option to become modularized. So we've told the kernel we want to build in config, the config file into the kernel. We also want to select the next option, which is enable the access to that config through the proc virtual file system. Uh, so I'll select that. And you can see it tells you where it is. It's in the proc and it's called config.gz. So basically the kernel creates a, a virtual file called config.gz. 
it does this on the fly it's not an actual file that exists because it's in the virtual file system but we can treat that as any normal gzip file we can do zcat on it to decompress and display it um, so that's how we can access the information for the config within that's stored within the kernel so two I think really important options to always have enabled I can't think if you're building kernels regularly I can't think when you'd never want to have those options set uh, just because they're so convenient um, initial RAM file system is the next one um, as I said I don't use this so uh, you probably wouldn't need to use it building a custom kernel so just press spacebar to disable that and you see a lot of options have been disabled automatically because they're reliant on that being enabled some situations in Gen 2 um, depending on the hardware the architecture you're using I have had to enable that uh, purely to get something else working but then that's needs must um, and that is Gen 2 things are done slightly differently um, but as I say on a normal day-to-day -day system that's not needed I've never needed it for Linux from scratch either um, but as I say depending on what distribution you're using depending on how your system's configured 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 sorry um, or what hardware you're using you may need to enable that um, Profiling support is the other one I'm going to go to. Don't need that. Um, I think that just enables profiling mechanisms. It's, there's a chance that that might slow down the kernel a little bit. It will probably increase the size of the kernel a little bit. So that's all really to take note of uh, in the general setup. So we'll just go to exit and we'll move on. Obviously, this is a 64-bit machine. I don't want to disable that option, so just skip over that. We'll go to process the type and features. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is a modern CPU, so it's got multi-core. I do want symmetric uh, multi-processing support. Um, and obviously leave this, um, which is part of the... I believe, oops, which is part of the... Um, SMP. All oh, right, okay. Looks like we don't need it. It says there for old SMP systems that do not have proper AC, ACPPI, ACPI support. New systems, especially with 60 volt CPUs with ACPI, these two features will override it. So it looks like we don't need that. So I can disable that because it's a fairly modern CPU. Avoid speculative indirect branches and kernels. So this is some mitigation for the recent um, problems with CPUs and vulnerabilities with CPUs so you want to leave that enabled as it says there it needs a modern compiler with this option um, so that it can be compiled with that the kernel can be compiled with that option so we'll leave that um, extended non PC x86 platforms we can probably disable this because this is an x86 platform so let's get rid of that um, let's have a look maximum number of CPUs uh, I haven't got 64 CPUs you'll see there it says um, each supported CPU as about 8k to the kernel image so 864s is quite a lot that's probably about a meg actually thinking about it so um, it's quite excessive so I would tend to want to reduce that this has got four cores um, this processor if you've got processors with more cores or you'd be moving the kernel around you might want to increase that to the maximum that you know you've got so you might want to increase it to 8 or 16 or whatever 
uh, the maximum number of cores are that you um, have with your machines but I'm just going to stick with four on this one uh, mean machine check exception well this is not an AMD chip so I can get rid of that um, it's handy to have this because you'll get error messages appear in the kernel log if there's any machine check exceptions I have got a system that does issue machine check exceptions um, occasionally um, from what I've read and not messages that are particularly worrisome but it is handy to know if there are hardware problems for example if it's overheating or uh, errors in memory and, and so on performance mo uh, monitoring now um, I'm never too sure about these from what I've read if you've got an Intel uh, generation 6 or newer processor you probably want to leave these active I'm not sure about AMD um, I couldn't really find much about that so being this is a uh, generation 7 CPU I'm going to leave these options set but anything older than the 6 you can um, remove them um, CPU microcode um, I do have that enabled on Gen 2 machines because it's relatively easy to enable Linux from scratch I think um, I've probably only installed it once I think off the top of my head I don't tend to use it basically because I don't really use Linux from scratch as my day-to-day -day operating system anymore I used to but um, not anymore uh, so it's, it's down to you whether you are going to be activating that and loading um, you know you just obviously download the microcode and configure the system to install that um, I'll leave it in there for now but I tend to say not to unless it's Gen 2 this is not specifically Gen 2 kernel but I will leave it in there for now otherwise just disable that option you'll see both the other options disappear um, NUMA memory allocation this it recommends I believe to yeah if you've got a 64-bit Intel and it's an i7 or later or you've got an AMD Opteron or uh, an EM64T NUMA based system to set it um, and if you've got a 32-bit system only enable it if it's a kernel on a 64 NUMA 64-bit NUMA platform so this is an i5 so I'll be disabling this let's so say if, if it's an i7 it recommends to enable it or you've got an AMD uh, check for low memory corruption this is a bit of a funny one I've had this enabled for a long time I've started disabling it I'm not really noticing different but it's something to bear in mind if there are BIOSes out there that are corrupting memory that you can um, tell the kernel to uh, avoid that part of the memory so I'm going to disable that um, now next bit here is MTRR cleanup uh, this I believe is more to do with GUIs um, it's I believe a feature where memory can be consolidated to allow faster transfers of data um, for graphics cards I think that's what it's to do with um, but it has been replaced by something called PAT I think it's called so I tend to enable this but it's quite a complicated thing to configure correctly I've got one system where it's quite choosy as to what options are on here and if they're not set correctly I'll get quite a few lines in the um, kernel log saying that it couldn't find the right value um, it's only one machine that happens on for some reason but I tend to leave this option selected the pat which is used on more modern processors it, that tends to be an automatic equivalent of this MTRR but it does no harm to have it um, do this cleanup support you'll see this option here with the dashes means that this option has been forced 
by another option somewhere else. So I can't actually change that to yes or no because it's reliant on a, on a previous option that's been set. So, so I think I'd probably recommend to turn that on. If you do get lots of errors about MTRR, you'd have to search the internet to find out um, and understand why those errors are. And that then would mean you'd have to modify these two options here, in particular the second option. Um, it's a bit of a, a strange beast that I don't completely understand. So I, I, I wouldn't want to advise you one way or the other on how to set that up. Um, but it does seem to be a recommendation from recommendation for what I've read to to enable this cleanup support. Um, EFI options on a modern machine with UFI, you do want to enable this. Um, mixed mode support, you probably don't want to enable be, um, unless you know you've got this situation here. It says it allows the 64 bit kernel to be booted on 32 bit firmware. So I believe the UAFI is supposed to be 64-bit only, but there are 32-bit hacks. Um, so it does actually say that if you're not sure, to say no. And there are some options, as I said before, where it says if you're unsure, do this. So I don't think you'd normally need that. I always remove it. Um, so there you are. Stub support, you probably wouldn't need to... Um, enable this because as it says it allows the kernel sorry it allows the UAFI to boot the kernel immediately without a bootloader so normally the bootloader would be started because the UAFI is told where the bootloader bit of EFI code is and that's why that you get a bootloader coming up you can tell the UAFI no boot this bit of code instead uh, and that bit of code can be the kernel do have to be a little bit careful there that um, there's a chance you could have trouble booting the machine because a bootloader gives you another layer where you can boot something else and by removing that you'll tend the machine to boot straight into a bit of code if the code doesn't work that that kernel doesn't work correctly it could be um, something that causes problems so you may want to delete that as well unless um, whatever you're following you know if you're following information about installing some special hardware or something or you've got um, special requirements on your machine if it says you need stub support obviously in, in, enable it um, but wouldn't tend to need that I don't think if you, especially if you're using a bootloader um, right the KXEC system call um, yes, I'm not really sure about this one. I think I've normally delete it. As it says there, no good recommendation, recommendation can be made. It's to do with um, starting another kernel from an existing kernel. So I would say unless you know you're going to do that, you probably don't need this option. Uh, that would be probably my advice, I think. Kernel crash dumps, you probably don't need that unless you understand what the crash dumps are or somebody's asked for them um, in order to um, you know, debug some problem you're having. So I would get rid of that. Um, I think that's probably all we need to change there. So let's exit that and move on to power management and AC ACPI. Um, hibernation, disable it if you're not using it, otherwise you can leave that in there. I don't tend to use it because I don't tend to use hibernation. Probably you would use it if you're using a laptop, but desktops probably not. Um, Probably, yeah, you probably don't want to enable this. So I would, that's to do with tracing, you probably, unless you know you are tracing something, you probably don't want that. Um, you probably also don't want debug support either for that matter. Looks like it's got rid of that event tracing one actually. 
So yeah, I'll I'll just de disable the debug support and don't have to worry about the tracing. ACPI, yeah, you definitely want that enabled on a modern uh, machine. Um, probably don't want the console redirection support. And then I would just select any of these that you're interested in. So AC adapter, you probably want battery. You probably want on a laptop, a desktop. There's no battery, so I can get rid of that. You can see there's a couple of options already forced on here. Fan, you probably want that one. Docking, again, that's probably only to do with laptops if you've got a docking station. Thermal zone, you want to leave that up. Um, boot time graphics. Yeah, you might want to leave that enabled and just accept the rest of the options. Um, There's another option here. I oh, know it's on the parent menu. Yeah, that's right. It's this frequency one. Um, this is to do with frequency scaling. You can see there's several options here. The interesting ones are performance, which um, runs the CPU at maximum frequency. Um, power save will run the CPU at its minimum frequency, um, whatever that is designated at as user space um, that's configured on because that's the default one that's set at the moment that allows you to modify um, the frequency yourself or some program you you would run in the operating system so user space is the operating system effectively or any app that's running on the operating system um, on demand will run the CPU at the slowest CPU frequency until it thinks it, there's demand for more CPU power, in which case it will ramp up the frequency. And I believe conservative is similar to on demand, but a bit more stricter about how it um, ramps up. So I tend to just use the performance governor. You might want to leave on demand available as well if you want to have some, you know, power. Uh, save some power a little bit you know where it cycles down the frequency if the machine's just idling there um, or if you're using a laptop you probably do want power save and then you just select which of those that are enabled that you want to use so I'm going to stick on performance you notice know, because I've deselected the user space from this option user space is now there I can deselect that because I, I won't be setting that I might leave the on-demand because that might be handy to switch to if I want to you know, save a little bit of heat or or um, energy. Um, so the next options are specific to AMD or Intel. This is an Intel, so one option's already set there, probably because one of the Intel options I've set previously. Um, probably don't want to change any of these others. No, I'd probably just accept those, I think. Oh, this legacy one. So that looks like that's to do with AMD, yeah, it says there. So that one says if in doubt, say no. So that might be an option to leave in or it might be an option to take out so in doubt take it out that's what I've done um, CPU idle don't look like there's anything to set there CPU idle driver for Intel processors um, probably want to set that then because I've got an Intel processor uh, one thing, one option I did skip over actually on this processor type and features um, could be quite important is this option here, processor family. Um, you can see it's because we created a default config, a default x x64 config. 
um, it selected a processor family, just a generic 64-bit x86 processor. Um, if you know specifically what CPU you've got in any one of these families, it's probably best, uh, probably more efficient to set. So if you've got a 64-bit Athlon, that's the option you want to set. Um, if you've got one of the early 64-bit Intels or Xeons, um, you'll want that one. If you've got one of the newer core or yeah, core-based Pentiums or core-based Xeons, you'll want that option. Or if you've got an Intel Atom Atom 64-bit, you'll want that option there. So this is obviously a core-based, core 2-based processor. Uh, I'll se select that option. So let's continue now with bus options. Um, you probably want to select that option there to get a generic system frame buffer. Next option, binary emulations. Um, unless you've got a multi-lib installation where you can run 32-bit and 64-bit um, binaries, you probably want to disable that. I run solely 32-bit or 64-bit systems. I don't run 64-bit systems that can run 32-bit code, so I'll be disabling that. Firmware drivers, um, probably the only one you want here is, yeah, that can be quite useful to have selected. EFI, now you may want, depending on how your machine boots, um, you may need to select some options here um, to help the system boot. Uh, I'm going to leave them blank at the moment. Likewise, this option here. Um, probably want to leave that as default, but uh, if you have problems booting, you might want to see about changing some of those options. Virtualization, if you're using KVM support, then you'll need to set that. Otherwise, uh, you can disable that. General architecture options, uh, K probes, I think that can be disabled. Yeah can be set to know if in doubt. Um, this option here can be, oh this looks like a new option here, let me just have a look at this one. Oh yeah, okay, so it looks like you can set link time optimization uh, to be on all the time globally. Um, as it says, it's quite resource intensive, so I'll leave that as off. Um, right, that one you probably want to leave enabled. Um, GCC plugins. Um, I've left this on, but I've started leaving it off recently, so. I'm not sure if it's like an advanced option or not. The load of mod modules that provide extra features to the compiler, I'm not aware that I have any of those or that anything is using them. So as I say, I've started to disable that. But um, if you find anything untoward when compiling the kernel, then you may, may need to activate that again. Um, loadable module support. Um, unless you are specifically not compiling and you don't want any modules specifically to be created, um, then you can disable that. Um, I think I've got one or two machines where I have actually disabled that and it is purely one monolithic kernel. Um, but as I say, on modern machines with network adapters and so on, you probably, well, unless you're prepared to not have them working, which is obviously pointless, um, they do need to be set as modules as I said earlier. Uh, the defaults are, are good. Yeah, I don't think there's any other options really needed there. Um, block layer. You can turn this one off, that's not needed, it's debugging. Leave the rest as it is. Uh, partition types, the default's good. 
Um, although you think you're missing out on the PC BIOS, MS-DOS partition and the GUI partition, they are enabled by default, so there's no point in uh, selecting them specifically. So you can just leave that as blank, unless you know you, you need other uh, partition types. Um, IO schedulers, I'm not sure what the advantages are of each of these. I tend to just uh, enable all of them. Um, in fact, this might be a candidate for modularizing all of these and just let the kernel decide which one is the right one to use. Um, I'll leave them built in for the moment. Executable file formats. Um, let's have a look at these. Yeah, you do want that. You probably don't want this. Um, core dumps. Oh, it does say if I'm sure, say yes. Okay, we'll leave that one there. Okay, so we need that one set. And yes, yeah, so it looks like it's recommended that they're all set. So we'll leave that one. Um, memory management options. Um, I think this is probably a good one to turn on. Transparent allows huge pages, allow the kernel to use huge pages and huge TLB transparently to the applications whenever possible. This can improve computing performance to certain applications by speeding up page faults during memory allocation, by reducing the number of TLB misses and by speeding up the page table walking. So it does say if memory constrained on embedded, you may want to say no. So an ordinary desktop, you wouldn't be constrained with memory. So that's probably a, a good one to um, set. And I tend to just leave the always option selected. Um, I don't normally change anything else there. Must be I don't understand the majority of this. So let's move on to networking support and network options. And I tend to just cut this right back here. Um, you'll need the packet socket, you need the main sockets. I don't think I enable this one. Okay, it does say to leave it as yes. I think I do actually disable that normally. Um, you want TCIP, TCP IP networking. You probably want multicasting. Oh no, it is okay to say no. Uh, advanced router, unless you know you want these options, get rid of that. Kernel level auto configuration, so if you've got these methods of booting, I'll get rid of that one. Uh, I think I'll get rid of this one as well. It does say if you say yes here, you can disable it at runtime um, by doing what it says there. So I'm just going to disable it here, I don't know what it is. Um, so look at this one here. Okay, so if unsure, say no. So I'm not really sure what that is. Again, if unsure, say no. I'll get rid of that one. IPv6, I don't use that, so I'm going to get rid of that completely. And again, if unsure, so packet filtering. Um, yeah, it depends on what you're using your uh, Linux machine for. Uh, I tend not to have this enabled. As it says there, there's a lot of text there, I'm not going to read it. If you're using like a firewall or possibly if you're... Um, Yeah, there's a proxy server there if you're using proxying as well, uh, bridging a firewall. So I don't do any of that, so I'm going to uh, use no. But obviously, if you are using a machine for any of those uh, purposes, then you'll want to leave that there, maybe even set some other options. Um, this one I tend to get rid of as well. So it's basically, as it says here, uh, if you say no, you'll just get a first come, first served buffer or scheduler. 
Um, and if you say yes, you'll get other algorithms you can select. So there's all these other ones here. Um, quite a lot to choose from. You'd have to obviously understand what they all do, but I'll just get rid of that. Just use the accept the default. Uh, I think I get rid of this one as well. Network device rough count I'll use in per CPU if this option is set. This can be forced to end to detect underflows with a performance drop. Oh, maybe we want to leave that in then. So I think that's it for that one. Uh, so wireless, yeah, I think all the defaults are here. You don't want to touch any of these. Uh, what's this? Oh yes, yeah, you leave that one there. That's worth setting. Um, this can be quite ETH tool can be quite a handy tool. I do use it on one machine in particular to reconfigure the network card. Um, its capabilities, so it's um, up to you whether you know you're going to be using ETH tool or not. Um, yeah, another one worth mentioning is Bluetooth support, so you probably want to set that there. Um, not sure what protocols you're using so one good way is to select these as modules and then they'll get built as modules and the correct one will be used and then if you do decide to build it in once you know the correct one you can actually build it in assuming it works uh, high speed yeah this is the later one so you probably want that enabled LED triggers um, that might be worth leaving until you get the Bluetooth working. And then you'll want to select um, which driver you're using. So again, it's probably best to, well, in fact, we can use LSPCI tool, LSPCI minus K will show the modules um, and look here to see what's installed or what's being used uh, let's have a look at LS USB I think that this is the actual Bluetooth adapter here. So you'd have to, I'd have to do some research on what driver is required for uh, enabling the Bluetooth. As you can see at the moment, I haven't got it enabled. Um, Yeah, no Bluetooth. So I haven't actually got it enabled on this machine, even though... Oh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's got Bluetooth on it. So uh, I can't really show you that because I don't know what to set it as. But as I say, what I would do is I'll do some research about the machine, find what driver it uses. I might even set all of these to identify what driver is using, set, set them all to module, modular. Um, and narrow it down and then recompile the kernel just with that one driver that's needed rather than having them all compiled um, excessively. So what I'll actually do is I'm going to leave this disabled for the time being. Um, that's something I need to do in the future. So let's go to device drivers. Now this is the biggest section as you might guess it's got information or selections for Device, all the different types of devices connected. 
So let's run down this. So PCI support, um, PCI Express. So it looks like if you've got native hot plug and so on, you'll probably want to leave that enabled. Otherwise, it's possibly okay to disable it. Um, I'll get rid of that actually. Support for PCI hot plug. So if you have got hot plug, I haven't, so or not to know of, I'll get rid of that. So these are just about specific controller drivers, so you won't want to install anything there. So I think the rest can be left as it is. Um, PC card, car bus support, I haven't got that on this machine. Generic drive options, so you probably almost certainly want the top option deselected, it's not used anymore. Um, So if you want some more messages in the kernel about devices, you can leave that set. Otherwise, as it says there, just set it to no. Now the firmware loader, um, it's for adding in binary blobs to the kernel so the kernel can enable hardware correctly at boot time. Um, and what you'll see, we might see this when I boot this kernel, Yeah, so there's two there that I'm getting for the wireless. There's two uh, bits of firmware that I need to add into the kernel to enable the wireless properly. Now, the wireless does work. Um, it just might be that it's working at its slowest speed or it's not working efficiently. And by loading these in uh, to the kernel, it, it will allow the... Um, well, A, will stop these messages appearing, but also allow the hardware to be uh, running at, at its best. The only thing with firmware is that it's a bit involved. You have to install the correct firmware file in the correct location. So, for example, this one here needs to be in lib firmware is the usual place. So a directory under lib called firmware and then another subdirectory called rtl underscore nick. And then within that the file name there so if I look at my lib firmware directory okay looks like I've already got one of these files here and I've got some other stuff here as well which I'm not getting errors for because they're already activated and therefore the graphics card under that one and you can see some microcode for that one so to Add in this, I'd need to hunt down either my distribution would give me that, which Gen 2 funnily uh, does support, or you might have to fish around on the internet for this firmware. Um, and as I say, it needs to be installed correctly. So I'd need to create a directory in this lib firmware called RTL underscore Nick and then put this specific file in that directory and then add it into the kernel as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in this regulatory DB as I've already got this into the kernel that I'm creating. Um, and I do that by adding it in here. And what I do is I just add in the file name with any subdirectory. So if it was this one, I'd add in that information into the field. As it's only regulatory.db, it goes directly into lib firmware. And as you'll see when I go back, lib firmware is the default that the kernel uses. So I just add in that. And you can see I've got a new option that's appeared where I can actually set where the firmware directory is. But that's the default normal place for it. So I'm not going to change that option. But now what it means that it's going to build in, it'll read... Uh, this file from lib firmware so that file there and it will build it into the kernel so that the kernel can activate that bit of uh, firmware when as the kernel's built uh, booting 
if you read about this, it tells you how to add in extra ones because there it takes multiple or it can take multiple firmware. Um, and you can see it takes space separated names of firmware files. So really what I want to do also uh, is to add in the files for the graphics adapter. So I need to find out what they are called. And it's just one in there. So I need to also add in the firmware for the graphics here. So it's space. The directory name is uh, i915. So I'll copy that. Paste that in forward slash because it's a subdirectory and copy the name of the firmware that is needed for my graphics card. The kernel kindly tells me what the firmware is that I need to get to add in. Um, I'm sure if you put in your graphics or your CPU um, and find out what graphics uh, card it is, what level it is, you'll, you'll be able to find out and download this from Intel I imagine this bit of firmware uh, as I say I can't be more specific because different uh, distributions will behave differently but this is a, a generic way of adding it into the kernel so those two have been added um, got the default location I want to leave this option checked I think it yeah it does say yes I think it can cause problems if it's uh, not checked so move on to bus devices no not interested in anything there uh, not sure if that's needed actually I think I'll need to disable that one so next one I'll go down to is plug and play support yeah that's good to have the me debugging messages so you can see what's coming up um, as, as you see, it says any doubts about this, say yes here. Obviously, if you're looking to reduce the kernel the, the, the size, disabling that will uh, make the kernel a little bit smaller. Block devices, you normally don't want to touch anything here. here. Um, on some of my old machines, or older machines, I've got a floppy disk, so that's where you'd add that in to enable floppy disk access. SCSI device support, um, at the very minimum, you want everything that's there. Um, SCSI error reporting, yeah, it says in doubt, say yes there. You probably don't want it on most of the time, especially if you haven't got SCSI. You do need the SCSI subsystem for SATA because it's based on it. Um, so if you are trying to get either SCSI or SATA working, you might want to leave that in there until you know it's working, but it's not really needed uh, if you haven't got SCSI. SCSI reports a lot more information, so it's probably worth leaving that in there if you have got pure SCSI. Likewise, generic support you, you won't need if you've got SATA, you know, serial ATA only. Uh, legacy proc SCSI support, yeah, it might be useful to look at the subsystem uh, again probably don't need that I'm going to leave it in there it might be useful so if you've got serial ATA or paralyzed ATA this is where you set it all um, verbose reporting again you probably want to see this coming up it's only 6k um, you'll see messages come up in the kernel log about what hardware it's finding you probably don't want port multiply support uh, unless you know you've got one you pr can probably safely disable that most modern hardware controllers are based on AHCI I think probably in the last 10 years if not longer so uh, you definitely want to accept that uh, ATA SFF support small four factor for legacy IDE and uh, parallel ATA so if you've only got a SATA system you can get rid of this um, because it will be using this AHCI driver if you've got an older system 
then you'll want to activate that and either select one of these options if you've got one of those or activate this ATA BMDA which is already activated for us with this and then choose these uh, older chipsets here but as I say generally on a modern you know certainly probably within the last five or ten years certainly within the last five years and probably ten years um, you probably want to get rid of that um, and that's all that's needed um, multiple device for driver support so if you're using RAID or LVM you'll probably want to select this I don't use I used to use RAID um, since discovered ZFS I don't use RAID I've never used LVM I, I understand what it is but um, again using ZFS it's uh, an unnecessary thing for me so I'll get rid of that um, now some Macintosh device drivers here when I was doing my Macintosh uh, Linux and Scratch videos I wasn't aware of this but um, it, in fact I only one option there to uh, support the two and three mouse button emulation because the uh, mouse is effectively only two buttons so that's all that does really there but, but on a non Macintosh uh, machine that's not required so we'll disable that network device support so this is about the hardware rather than the actual capabilities um, this is the network hardware core driver support um, as you see there if you're not using anything like VLAN bridging bonding or anything you can get rid of that um, I think that's right yeah Ethernet driver support you need to select um, what uh, hardware you've got and the only way you can do that is either by reading the manufacturers gumpf or you can get some hints by doing LSPCI minus K um, it will tell you well that's the wireless adapter the one we're after is this one here which is what we're looking at, at the moment is the Ethernet controller so you can see it's telling me what kernel driver is in use that's the one R8169 so a quick cheat here well first of all is to delete all of the drivers that are activated so already we're saving a lot of uh, compile time and space with the kernel because by default it's compiling all these network adapters and that's unnecessary it's usually best to go to the bottom and work upwards I find rather than working down because you spend a lot of time scrolling up and down trying to find the next option to deactivate whereas doing it this way it pulls the list down and I'll just find it a lot easier so let's disable all of these uh, Right, it's a bit tedious but remember once this is done as long as you keep your config file you'll never be doing it again so nearly there Okay, so that's it. So everything that's been disabled, We've got no Ethernet adapters selected. Now, if I press the forward slash, I get a, a window come up allowing me to search for configuration parameters. So this is allowing me to search 
any of the configuration symbols and as you saw I'm looking for a kernel with a kernel option a kernel drive with the name R8169 in so I'm going to paste that in here and press enter and you can see it's found it under real tech advisors uh, uh, devices and it's also got an option there one and if I press one on the keyboard it'll take me directly to that option I press space to activate that and then all I've got to do is look for 8169 and there it is and as you can see uh, before as remember I you know, said you might need to activate these as modules I always try my luck and just build them in straight away to see if it works if I find it doesn't work then I know I've got to come back and set it as a, a module like that but for now I'm going to build it in to see um, if that works when I press exit this actually takes me back to the search result exit that and it takes me back to where I was before so you can see it nests it but as you can also see it's updated the window uh, or the options that was there, there before another thing I could do is do help and it will tell me the symbol here config underscore r8169 that's the uh, text that this bit here is referring to ignore the fa fact that the R is in lowercase here it's case insensitive so I know straight away that I've got the right um, kernel driver activated for the Ethernet card that's in this machine uh, let's just do help there again right it does actually recommend that it's built as a module so I'm going to actually set that to a module because of the recommendation so that's the Ethernet um, this option here now I'm not sure I've seen this once or twice before I don't know yeah that looks like that's been forced activated with the curly brackets but I can't deselect it I can select, change it whether it's a module or built in but I can't actually deselect it, so maybe that's what the curly brackets means. USB network adapters. Yep, I've got one of them, but I don't normally use it on this machine, so I'm going to deactivate that. Wireless network. Similar thing to before. I normally just deactivate all of these first of all. And if an LSPCI doesn't show up your hardware, then one other option, well, there's two options actually. The hardest way is to go searching on the internet for the model of PC or network adapter you've got and trying to find out what support there is in Linux for it. The easier option is to bootstrap another distribution like a live CD, a live, live distribution, and do um, an LS mod there to find out what modules are installed or you could do an LS PCI there to see if that will report what modules installed once you've got that information you can come back to your kernel configuration and search for that module um, so that's a, a good way of doing it so let me go back to my LS PCI I can see the wireless adapter it's a Qualcomm Atheros QC. In fact, I have a feeling that this is a combined, I think that's why it's got two different numbers there. I think one's the Bluetooth and the other one's the uh, actual wireless. I'm not sure about that for certain, but um, yeah, because I haven't got the Bluetooth working on here yet, but uh, that's not to say it won't work, it's just something I don't use much, so I don't activate it. Um, but the wireless is important, I use it as a fallback for when I haven't got wireless uh, wired connectivity but more importantly you can see um, the kernel driver is called ATH 9K and you can see it's actually built as a module ATH 9K um, it's a module which is interesting because you can see this one doesn't specify module which shows that I've actually have actually built this in and it is working because that's what I've got connected at the moment but as I say, because it's recommended to be built as a module, that's how I've left it as a module. So I now need to search for this driver, ATH9K. So I'll go back here. I'll do the forward slash 
paste that string in, press enter. We've got quite a few here. Well, it's not ATHK 9K underscore AHB or anything else. So this is the one I want. It's number one. I'll press one. I'll press space to select that. Um, I've then got to try and track down which of these options is the one that I want. So let's look for some information. It's a QCA 9565 or AI, AR 9565. So let's see if we can see that anywhere in the description. So I can't directly, but there's two here with five triple X. So that indicates one of them could be the right one. Uh, no, sorry. These are nine, five, six, five, sorry, nine, five, six, five. So what I need to do here is just to go into the help of each of these and look for information um, about each of these. Now it could be that just this option is that that is enough. Um, if I go to help here, oh no, it isn't actually. It doesn't say 90HK there, so it's just this is just an option to activate all the Atheros options. So yeah, what I need to do is do help on each of these and look for an option that says 80H9K here. So that one says 80H5K. So it kind of indicates that I'm on the right track here. So that's not that one. So ATH9K, so this is the one that I want. And it just says here, if you want to build this as a module, it will be called ATH9K. It doesn't actually tell me to or recommend me, but I am going to just build it as a module. And you can see um, when I've selected this, I'll get other options appearing. Uh, and strangely, it's, uh, it does happen, but occasionally, if I press space again, I've changed it to a module, but this option also, also appeared. And it does actually say a Theros Bluetooth coexistence support. So it does seem that this Bluetooth and the wireless are part of the same bit of hardware. I've also got this option that's appeared below as well. So if I get rid of it, you see the next option below the one that I just activated is a Theros HTC based wireless card support. When I've selected it, I've got all these options here that have appeared. So uh, let's look at these. It enables the PCI bus support in the ATH9K. So that's probably what it's connected to because it appeared in the LSPCI. Yes, you can see it's on this uh, third bus here. So I definitely want that option set. Don't know what AHB... So it says say, say in if unsure. Debugging, I'm not really interested in that. It's probably going to work. If you're having trouble getting it working, you might want to enable that. Um, I'm not sure if I need any of these. Wake on wireless LAN is experimental. I don't tend to enable experimental features unless I really do need them. Uh, what's this one about? Multi-channel concurrency. No, I'm not sure what that is, so I'll leave that. Uh, disabled. There's one more here. Okay, so these are not, these devices here are not normally in desktops is basically what it's saying. They're normally in device, devices or appliances. So, and it does say eventual select 10. Uh, I don't think I needed that. So that's my wireless setup. I can exit. I've set it as a module as recommended. Well, sorry, not as recommended as it is at the moment, although it seems like I maybe could get it working as a built in. Uh, I'll leave it as a module for now. Um, as I say, I don't normally use the wireless, so leaving it as a module is probably a better thing for me. I normally use wired. It does mean if I've got the wire plugged in, I've used it for something else, that the module will be loaded and the wireless will be activated. So it's probably the best configuration in my situation and obviously you choose how you want yours. Uh, right, so that's that part, that's the networking done.
input device support. Um, the only one here you probably might want to disable is the sparse key map. Um, and then things like joysticks, game pads, unless you know you've got them, or tablets, touch screens, miscellaneous devices. Don't use any of them, so I can get rid of those. Um, probably don't need to change anything there either. Character devices. Um, certainly, if you're building Linux from scratch, it needs, as part of the build, PTY support. So I always, because of that, I don't know if I'm going to use this kernel to build Linux from scratch, I always enable it. It does say it's legacy. It's been legacy for years and years, um, but it's obviously still needed by certain things. So um, I'll always enable that. Uh, serial drivers don't have any serial ports on this machine that I'm aware of. Very rarely use them now. Um, and if I do use them, it tends to be on the older machines. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this machine hasn't got a serial port, although there are some modern machines that do have them, or you can still get in, uh, get um, plug in PCI adapters for serial ports if you're using them for certain, certain devices, use them. So that's where you would set that. <clears throat> uh, don't need that hardware number random number generation unless you know you've got uh, hardware that can generate random numbers uh, for example I've got a PC that's got a, an AMD hardware random generator support I'll enable that but this is this machine doesn't just deactivate that in fact deactivate it from the top level there Um, NVRAM support, um, that's optional I suppose if you need that to, you, know, you might want to interrogate it or might have a bit of software that does that. Um, that's probably that one. I2C support, probably want to leave that enabled. Um, Bus support, yeah, it's defaulted to an Intel. It's probably what's activated on here. Um, I can actually do something else I haven't shown you yet. You can do D message and pipe that through grep minus I for ignoring the case I two C. And yes, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see that I two C is on this machine. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give me any more information. <clears throat> but I would suggest that it's an Intel-based machine. Um, that, that should be sufficient, 82801. Uh, anything here about this right so it uses the 801 Intel 801 SM bus um, but not anything unfortunately specifically about Oh, yeah, this is the 801. Yes, that's right. I uh, didn't actually notice any of them there, but there's it, uh, a pretty good chance, because this is an Intel chipset, that this is the driver I want. Uh, I'd like to find something to confirm that, though. C230 series chipset family. Is that the USB? Oh, I two C I A O one. I 
Let's look for it in the D message. So it's got that SM bus. Uh, maybe it's something I've not had activated before. Interesting. Hundred series. Looks like the chipset is hundred series slash C two thirty series. Um, but I can't see anything like that here. Whether there's an equivalent name, I've not seen that at all. Um, oh, it thinks it's a Xeon. Or is that just the chipset? Process a host bridge. No, that's strange that is, um, but I'm going to leave it in there, um, as I'm sure it's the right one. Let's have a look at this one. And that one. No, there's no mention of those modules, so I'm going to leave that as it is. Um, oh, what I will do is look for this module here, this SM bus ensure that's enabled. I'm sure it will be automatically based on what I've already okay, it's not based on what I've already selected. Come drive and use. That's interesting. I can't find it. Eto one. There's a chance it could have been renamed or it's a driver that gets generated automatically. So I'd have to check that. Uh, when a boot. Let's look for SMB. Okay, there's some specific Dell SM BIOS drivers, which uh, possibly something I need to set. So that could be part of this uh, problem I've got here. I can't quite see things that are being is being reported by LSPCI. <clears throat> um I'm not sure if I passed that option or not. I'll have to go back and check those Dell options for this particular machine. But anyway, uh, I'll carry on. So that might be something I want to keep is for precision timekeeping over the Ethernet. Watchdog timer. Uh, probably don't need this. Yeah, if I'm sure, say no. Um, oh, we've gone too far. Where do we get to? Hardware monitoring support. So this is useful if you set up uh, the LM sensors. Um, there's a program in there which can probe the hardware to find out what sensors you've got. And you come here and enable those sensors. 
Uh, I don't think I've set LM sensors up on this machine. No, I haven't. So I don't know what to set there at the moment without further investigation. So I'm just going to disable that. Thermal drivers, you'll want to leave that as it is. Um, yep, leave that as it is. Multifunction devices. Again, if there's any any of this hardware that you need, this is where you'd set it. So I'll go into graphics support next. Um, AGP, there's not an AGP bus on this system, so I'll get rid of that. It's just PCIe. Direct rendering manager. Now these settings depend on whether you're running um, a graphics environment or not. Uh, have to configure the frame buffer specifically. It has to be done in a certain way. So um, exports for your. Yeah, I don't think there's any changes that need to be made there actually. As long as it's enabled, it'll lay to run the GUI. Um, because it's an Intel got HD graphics, so I need this enabled. And the other options can be left as they are as well. Frame buffer devices. Yep. It's good to have a DFI based frame buffer, but generally, as far as I'm aware, uh, don't have any of the other options set here. I think that's right. It's it's worth checking what your existing kernel's got, the um, existing options, to be sure. It can be a bit of a, a minefield, this part, to uh, ensure that the frame buffer is configured correctly. Um, backlight controls if you've got a laptop. Console driver support that's okay to leave as it is. Boot up logo I generally just have the last one set. There's no point in having all three set. If you want the pretty little penguins coming up. Sound support is obviously optional if you're running a server you wouldn't enable this uh, but generally the uh, defaults are good enough. Might not need that one. Oops. Yeah, probably don't need that. So again, you probably don't want the debug unless you've got a specific need for it. Uh, now this is interesting, the PC speaker it does actually say to read the help and that's because it says not to enable it if you've selected a sound card because the PC speaker could uh, get all the action instead of your sound card and that might be why you, know, you think your sound card's not working. So I'll just dis disable that. For HD audio you need to select the PCI and unless you've got one of these card, that's all, cards that's all you need to select just go to HD audio and you'd have to find out what codec support your machine's using. I generally use the Realtek one, that seems to be fine. So I'll select that. And it does actually say there when you select it as a module, set it to Y if you want to auto load this codec driver, so you probably want that, so just set it to, to load. USB sound devices, haven't got any of them, so I can disable that. It's like six sound devices. Well, there's an option there for HD audio over the HD on Intel platforms, if, if that's a platform you're building for, so I can get rid of that in this case. 
hit support so it's human interface I think it is stand for um, do you want to generate yes you do yeah Spe special drivers again you probably unless you know you've got one of these devices it's time to just go up this list and remove all of these that, that it's just unnecessary compiling it'll just be sitting in memory doing nothing when the kernel's running not being used so we can deactivate all of these unless like I say you've got specific need um, so I'll get rid of these Uh, leave those as they are. And that's probably it, I think. USB support. I certainly want this. Um, most are probably going to be PCI based. Again, if the LS PCI will tell you that. Um, in fact, if we. Oh, I want graphic. Uh, it's easy to look down. There's the USB controller, and you can see it's using the XHCI protocol, and that's because it's USB 3. Um, and generally, there's a a few rules about this to make it easy to pick which driver. Um, I'll get onto the driver in a minute. Uh, you want to leave that set. You want to leave that set as well. Uh, monitor. Yeah, it looks like I want to keep that one. So, as you can see here, it's a XHCI. If you know you've got USB 3, you want to select that. If you've got USB 2, you'll want EHCI support. Um, then there's two more options for USB 1.1 and 1.0. And it depends um, who the hardware is made by, basically. Um, the OHCI, it's basically anything that's not a um, uh, an Intel or via, as it says there. So if you know you've got 1.1, or indeed I think this supports 1.0, um, or it might only be 1.1 this one actually, and it's not an Intel or a via, then you need to select this. If you've got USB 1.0 or 1.1, then and it's an Intel or via chip, then you'll want to select this option. And of course, if you're unsure, just set it to a module, do an LSPCI see what's in use, and then you can go back and uh, yeah, remove the options for the ones that you know you definitely haven't got. But as you can see, I've only got one USB controller on here. They're all, or at least all the USB ports are XHCI. So I don't need to enable the other options. I only need the XHCI option. So I'll get rid of that one. And just leave the USB 3. USB printer support, well, you'll need that if you've got USB printer. I don't use that, so I'll disable it. USB mass storage, this is a useful one if you're plugging in external hard drives or flash flash drives. And if you've got a specific model that's mentioned here, then enable it there as well. And I think that's it for that, yep. LED support, so if you've got devices with LEDs on and they're supported here, any of these chips, then you might want to enable them there. Real-time clock, the defaults are good, um, unless you've got certain clocks here. Uh, the default PC style CMOS clock should be selected, and there it is. Um, but if it's a bit of a quirky one, you've got different clocks. 
then you'll need to select one of the others. Um, I think this can be oh, maybe you'd leave that one there. Um, I think the rest of it, Vertio drivers, uh, that's for virtualization. So if you're not using virtualization, uh, some of these vhost drivers, I'll just get rid of them. Don't use that. Uh, platform specific drivers. So for example, I've got a Dell here, so I'll select that and yeah, I'll leave that. So maybe you can see here this Dell's SM BIOS. This could be where that um, Intel one's coming from. I'll leave them all as modules. Not sure if I need that one actually. Yes, yeah, for Latitude desktops. So I'll get rid of that one. Haven't got an airplane mode switch. BIOS update support. I'm unlikely to use that, so I'll get rid of that. Laptop extras. Haven't got that. So really, I've cut it down quite a lot anyway. I'll leave those options there. Microsoft Surface. That's not what this is. So there's no options there. Box hardware support can't change that. IO MMU, I'll never know whether this needs to be set or not. Um, it's definitely not an AMD, um, but as it's a relatively modern uh, processor, I'll probably leave it in. Uh, let's do a look on the message. Oops. Yes, yeah, so there's nothing that comes up, so I'm not really sure if that's required, but I will leave it in. Uh, these options here don't need to have anything there. I think that's probably it now. For that one, file systems, again, this is really down to your own personal preference and what you use the machine for. So um, I tend to have all of these options included in, in case I plug in an old USB stick with, you know, for example, an EXT2, or if you, indeed, if your boot partition is an EXT2, which is something I sometimes do. Quote support don't use, so I'll get rid of that. Uh, do we need this one? It will go away, this option, so let's get rid of it now. So I probably don't need the auto mounter. Fuse might be useful to install if you're using... Um, other file systems are either in development or haven't been included in the kernel. For example, ZFS had a Fuse plugin for a while until the, um, I think the ZFS on Linux project became a bit more mature. Um, caches, CD-ROM DVD file systems that's useful. Always include this as well in case the um, CD-ROM has been formatted with UDF. Maybe an option to put it as a module there, come to think of it. Um, DOS type partitions. Um, XFAT is useful to have these days. It seems to be becoming a bit more of a standard. And NTFS can be useful as well if you know you want to access NTFS partitions. Right support used to be experimental. It doesn't seem to be anymore. Um, it was recommended never to uh, enable it as it could corrupt the NTFS partition. Oh, it looks like they still don't guarantee that it will not damage any data, but it looks like it should be safe. But I tend to leave it as read-only, um, as it tends to be just stuff I want to read off of a NTFS partition rather than modify stuff. Um, I think here I'll leave this stuff as it is. Might want that, make that permanent. 
miscellaneous, I don't think I normally set anything here. Again, unless you've got a specific reason to access these partitions on the system you're building. Network file systems, again, if you use NFS, select the options and versions there. Um, I use Samba shares, so I'll select that. Native language support. Now, for myself, I select the default US one because some things will only recognize that. I'll select the 850, which I think tends to be more Western Europe uh, code page. ASCII is selected, that's good. That one's selected, that's good. And that one's selected. So the only thing I tend to do is just put in the um, 8859-1 here for um, default NLS. So that will be referring to that one. Which was supposed to be ISO in front of that. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be ISO in front of that. Um. Double check that. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the config I've got in the running kernel. So, as you can see, I'm using this config.gz that's in proc. So, this is just a virtual file that's been created or it'll be created when I access it. And I'm going to search for 88591 or 8859. So I'm doing ZCAT because it's compressed with GZ. Yeah, it is ISO. So that's the default character set I've, I've used. So that's right. What I've set. Any more options? No, that's that option. Security options. Um... This option is sometimes required by Gen 2 on, I think it's for LVM, is it? For one of the packages you install, so I'll, I'll make sure that's installed. Um, I think a lot of these other ones I don't normally have installed. Kernel mapping, yeah, I think that one's required. Yeah, I'll leave that one. But that's it there. Cryptographic. I don't normally touch this because I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I don't want to disable something that might be required. Library routines. Um, again, I don't really touch anything here except the one for compiling built-in fonts. If you notice, uh, if I go to a virtual terminal, um, how big the font is that's because I've built in that font into the kernel um, and to do that I select this select compiled in fonts option and then select the largest font which is this terminus one so it's 16 pixels by wide by 32 pixels high so it's at least double the size of a, an ordinary font and you know as soon as I select that the the compulsory, the mandatory font that you can't get rid of automatically disappears. It's obviously pointless having two built-in fonts, although you could do, I suppose. I don't know if you can actually select a font if you do compile more than one in. This one's a reasonably sized one. Um, it's not too bad. Some, As it says here, some systems don't support this terminus, so that one generally works. 
um, but even that says not supported by all drivers. So if, if you find it's not working, it's defaulting to the ordinary VGA 8x16, then you might want to try one of the other fonts. And likewise, if you want to have more on the screen, just select one of the smaller fonts, but obviously it's going to be harder to read unless you're on a huge screen. Lastly, kernel hacking. Um, I tend to just get rid of the debugging because I won't be using that. Tracers, debugging. Um, I don't know what this one's about. Oh, if in doubt, say yes. So I'll leave that there. Um, that's probably best to leave that there to have the early early messages coming up. And that is it for the kernel that we've so we've gone down each one of these options gone into most of the sub menus uh, to see what options there are so all i've got to do now is exit and select yes to save it and if i recall the command to view the config you can see it's still there but obviously the options would have changed now there's fewer enabled options so all I need to do now is to build it. Um, if you haven't got the make flag set, then you can use the minus J option to specify how many processes to run at once. And to build that, I think this takes about five minutes. Um, but while that's building, I'll go and have some lunch and come back and show how to activate it and reboot into this new kernel.